it was students posting keg parties at two in the morning. You know, we, we worked for a flight school, so we'd have operations well into the night, a couple days a week. So we'd have people posting their parties during night flight or just things like that. And I needed some way to not just secure the site from outsiders, but also secure the site from student workers and that that really could cause a lot of problems. So starting something like that that is best practices, one of the first things I did, and one of the reasons I did this was it was kind of a go big or go home. So many of these plugins are very small. They have one feature. If you talk to the developers, they probably haven't taken in a lot of money with it. There's, they're very simple projects, and that's great. You can get a lot of downloads that way. But if you want a successful project that's really going to be an income earner, it really is kind of a go big or go home situation. Gravity Forms, Yoast SEO, Jetpack, well, a different model on Jetpack, that's arguably probably the biggest as far as number of features. Better WP Security, when I sold it, had something like 30-something different features. It was doing everything from logging to all sorts of different ways to help you keep track of what users are doing on the site. But if I hadn't, if I had just stuck with trying to remake li limit login attempts, or if I had just stuck with trying to imitate what Brute Protect did, actually they were a very successful small plugin in that they sold into Jetpack and they're now Jetpack security feature. But that was a very unusual model for them. But if the, the way I was doing this as a side project, it really took all those features. It took that bringing them together into one product in order to be able to make this thing much more marketable. So if you are building a plugin, that simple is great. But the more you add to it, the more success you're going to be able to work off of it. Kitchen sink plugins are quite popular, whether you like them or not as a developer, and regardless of what your thoughts is it as a developer, just like Divi theme or Avada theme. If you, any of you guys are developers in the audience, probably hate working with those things. But there's a reason they sell, because they can do much more things. And from a marketing point of view, that's a great, great way to do it. And the second thing is not just make, putting all these features into a plugin, but we have to do this often. If you can go into just about any big plugin on WordPress.org and look at their download stats. You'll see spikes. Every time they release, you get a major spike, especially since WordPress, I think it was 2.7 or 3.7, that it did auto-updates. Once auto-updates or one-click updates came in, it's very easy to update, so you get that spike every time. And it wasn't until actually after I sold it that they told you how many active installs there are on a plugin. So that spike of downloads really boosted the only stats you have to say this is the most popular plugin out there. I actually tried for it every two-week release cycle, and I did, did that for almost a year and a half. Sometimes that was a new feature. Oftentimes that might be a typo. You know, it's almost a Facebook model on iOS or Android. They do every two weeks. That's very successful for them because it really does boost their, their image. Their, it really boosts their usage. So doing that with a plugin is just as valuable, especially a large plugin. As soon as I would go more than about a month, people would start dropping off. I could watch my donations drop off. I could watch my uh, support requests drop off. Not that that was a bad thing. But it's about that 30-day limit that things really start dropping off with the plugins. So keeping it a two to four week release cycle will really help build that plugin of visibility and it's going to really help you build your user base. Another big thing though is even with a user base, especially when you start getting large, teaching people how to use something that does everything is a nightmare. Particularly in security. I mean there's a very fine line between security and usability. If I give you a, a feature that says if somebody logs in too many times it's going to lock you out of the site, and you forget what your password is, who's it going to log out of the site? It's going to log you out of the site. So there's a very fine line between that usability and the security of some of these plugins. I could blog about that, I could write about that, I could do all this stuff with it, that's great. But it really is, a video is worth 10,000 words. If, you know, if a picture is worth 1,000, explaining it and walking people through how these features work. Uh, a lot of the marketing I did for that plugin is what I'm doing here right now is I actually went to WordCamps. I've been to WordCamps from London to San Diego talking about security. The, the ability to explain, the ability to sit one-on-one -on -one with somebody who's having a problem with it and actually show them how things work on a plugin that that's, comp that's that complicated or any product that that's complicated will take it so far above something that's just a blog post. Here's how you clear something. Those are great. You still have to have those for reference. Oh, I locked myself out. They need to be able to find and cut and paste something that'll fix their problem. But that's not going to build a loyal user base. It's the videos. It's the individual attention. It's frankly in a community like this where we're open source and it is about the developer. It's being able to see that developer's face that really helps build that reputation and really helps build the plugin and your user base even that much bigger. 
personal appearance is even better. You know what you're doing. Don't be afraid to say it. Some of these plugin developers I see, why did you build it? Well, I wanted to learn it or I, you know, I needed it for this and that. Okay, well, it's a security plugin or it's SEO, so tell me about security or SEO. Well, I don't really know that market. I hear this a lot with plugin developers. You see this with vendors, that, not so much in WordPress anymore, but a lot of these guys go to a lot of these, they know their products very well, but how many times have you been to a conference where you talk to a vendor who doesn't know their product? Or a developer who doesn't really understand what they're developing? When you're the sole developer on something, the fact that you've gotten it that far, and you've been able to release it, you've been able to build those features out, you are the expert on that topic. Don't be afraid to tell people you are. Don't be afraid to sell yourself and use that as a marketing opportunity for both your plugin and yourself. I've managed to make a name for myself as a security person. Most security, like Security, in fact, Tony from Security, who's now a fairly decent friend of mine, for a long time we didn't see eye to eye because I was not selling the type of product he was. I was selling something for best practices. It's a very different type of market. I was never trying to be a firewall. I'm not, you know, you can't really put a firewall in the application. If they've gotten that far, it's kind of too late. But just that ability to, to, to communicate that message, which took me a long time to really refine that message, makes a very big difference. So people like Security, people like WordFence and things like that. There's, there's quite a community there and you see us all talking about that product, but you also see more importantly us educate, educating on why. Why would you even want to feature that logs everything a user does. Why would you want this feature or that feature? You have a reason you built it. Don't be afraid to tell other, others what that reason is. And another big thing, especially with a plugin like Security or Security or Yoast SEO or any of these large plugins, and that something that's often forgotten with most plugin developers is the US is 300 million people out of 7 billion in the planet, seven and a half billion. Most of our users now are international. Biggest usage of our, these plugins, Avada theme is actually developed, I believe, in Pakistan, and it's English second. Uh, a number of uh, the other big products are developed in other parts of the world. Don't be afraid to ask for translations. Where I, what took me from 50,000 downloads to a million downloads was a Hindi translation and some of the other translations I put into it. Immediately being able to inject this, in, you know, this is a very developer-centric cent plugin, just by the fact it's security. So with such large markets in India and some of these other countries, just being able to provide that translation and asking for people to keep their translations updated, first, it makes a loyal user because now I'm giving credit to somebody on a million plus download plugin for their translation. So they're more than willing to give it to you. And now I've just opened myself up to entirely new markets. I had uh, over a dozen translations when I sold this plugin to iThings. I believe now it's English only and that's due to various reasons. But it really was those extra translations that numerous ways to get this plugin worldwide and outside of the US that really made it, took it to that next level. Don't forget to ask for donations on top of it. Your time's valuable. So many plugin developers I see never, you know, how much, did you make any money off of it? No, well why not ask? If it's helping somebody out, it's amazing how many times you can get in various donations. I had Matt Cuts from Google actually for one of my projects throw me a hundred bucks one time just to, just to say I actually kept the email more than I wanted the, the money off of it. But people are very willing to pay for something that's useful to them. It's not going to be every user, but if you wind up getting a plugin that's got a couple hundred thousand downloads even, if you get one percent of that giving you ten or twenty dollars, that adds up pretty quick. And that can add up very quickly on a plugin as it, as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it makes a very good incentive not just for, yes it's nice to have the money, but sometimes it, also, it can also help remind you why you're doing this and it provides a very good carrot, if you will, to help continue. Because when you have a project that's four years old and you're not making anything off of it, you're not getting that return, any kind of return at all. Providing yourself a little bit of a return is just as valuable for the monetary benefit, which may not be that much, as is just to remember what that motivation was in the first place and to, to continue that motivation, to continue doing what you're doing. It's a lot easier to give up on a project if you see no and if you see no reason to go than it is if you have something incoming on it. So ask for donations and ask for ratings too. Better WP Security has I think a third of the users is Yoast and almost four times the ratings if you look on wordpress.org. It has over a thousand ratings more than Jetpack when I last looked. This is, you know, click the five to one star. 
And what I, the way I do this for both donations and ratings is only the user that installs the plugin, and only after 30 days, so you know, you, you know they're using it, it pops up once in admin only and says, hey, if you like this, either rate it, talk about it, or donate. That thing took off. The amount of ratings that happen off of that is just amazing. Now when you screw up with that, when we released the first version of iTheme security, we had a large beta, but we did so much rewrite that we did have a problem with a feature that crashed a lot of sites. It happens. <laughs> and we went from, I think, 13 one-star reviews to 180 one-star reviews in about three days. We get a lot of ratings. <laughs> now, we're still at, that plugin today is still at a 4.7, even with 180 one-stars. To show you how much you can offset that, and even a, you, know, you ask for that, people are going to give you that five-star a lot. So just asking for that, if you do screw up, I'm still at a 4.7 with 180 ratings. How many plugins even have 180 ratings? Not that many. So keep it, keep that up. Make sure you're asking for that return and that as well and ratings as well as donations. Listen to your audience. This sounds easy, you know. Like I say, establish yourself as the expert. But if your users hate X feature, or if in my case I'm graphically challenged, so one of the things I always had a problem with was the options page. Has anybody used this plugin before? and looked at that options page, it's kind of a nightmare. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit it. Part of the reason I sold it to iThemes was for the help, was for the help with the UX. It was trying to help, what, what was the biggest pain point with users? And it was configuring the plugin, being able to listen to that. Or being able to listen that at a certain point in time, users were looking more for different features than what it originally started with as the communities evolved, as attacks have evolved. So listening to where your users' pain points are as far as the user, features themselves. We've pulled features from it that weren't being used. We've added features to it that people have requested. In fact, now the plugin, once it went to iThemes, it gives you the option for user tracking. That's strictly Google Analytics. It's completely opt-in. It sends a custom tag to Google Analytics with a JSON object, every option you've turned on and every option you've turned off. So you can very easily go see who's using what. Just for free, I mean, anybody with a plugin can do this. It's just a simple integration with this. It's a little tricky to pull that data back. But once you get your systems in place and, you, and you've got your, if, if you're a developer developing, you should be able to work with this type of JSON. It's very easy to, to listen to your users very passively just by seeing what they're doing with your work. So something like Google Analytics is a great tool for that. There's, you know, there's more official tools you can use with it, but just listening on the support forums, listening to the emails you get, I still get people. I locked myself out of my site, and even though my contact form says, I do not work with this plugin anymore, I do not do support on this page, I, it's amazing how, how much I still get, but I still pass these off to iThemes, because I'll still see things like, hey, there's a bug here, there's this there, there, listening still and passing this information back to who is developing it now is, is still very valuable. But as much as I listen, one of the big problems I've always had is saying no. Hey, this, this country blocking feature would be really cool. Or this, there's a list in there from a, a very good security guy out in California. His name's uh, Jim Walker. And he gives me this list of bad robots and things like that. And it, 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 he's got a very good list in there. It's actually been a pain point for some times because a lot of people, especially international users, a lot of those items on his list are legitimate international search engines that don't really apply to US users. I probably should have said no a little bit quicker when I put that in is what it comes down to. And there's been other things people have asked for. Can you put a firewall in it? No, it's not a firewall. Can you put something in there that's going to log absolutely everything somebody does? And I go, well, this is a small blog. Your database is going to quickly hit the size of uh, you know, a couple gigabytes very quickly. No, we're not going to put that in there. Just whatever the feature might be, you have to know what people are looking for. And at some level, if that's what everybody wants to do, we have a logging feature in Better WP Security. And in fact, one of my new projects is actually trying to do a logging plugin itself, because that is a very popular thing. But knowing how to use that and how to say no to that is also just as valuable. And there's been some really weird feature requests over the years. Individual, you know, can you do two-factor for this weird authentication system I have? Can you build Stripe and do it? Can you do, it's like, it, the whole point of this is you don't want to be you know, doing some of this stuff. So you do have some very interesting things and you have to filter that quite a bit. And when you're, sometimes when you're doing this, whether it's saying yes or no, no one wanted to ask for help. 
whether it's me going back to Tony and asking, hey, what do you see with these guys, or Security in general, and other people I know there, whether it's me talking to people out here who are, you know, iThemes, when I sold it, the, graphically, it sucked. I mean, just I, there's no other way I could say that. But being able to say, hey, I, th it's time to take this to the next level. I need the help to do that. In my case, it was an end, it was an endpoint. It was where I sold the plugin itself. I actually sold it, and iThemes owns all the rights to that plugin. But that was that was a way to ask for help. And over the years, I had other you know whether you're on GitHub and you're taking pull requests, that's a very good way to ask for help. I know I've contributed to some of Josh's projects. I've had other people contribute back. Whatever it might be, be open to what other developers are telling you. Whether it's code style or other things, it's amazing what just a little bit of openness can bring back into a project. Fixing the most obscure bugs that somebody else can pick up in five minutes. If your code's not out there and you're not asking for that help, if you're not receptive to that, it's just gonna be that much harder for you, especially on release time when somebody else finds the bug that they're using it. So that's what I did right with it. I was, able, I was always able to take that help. I did very well on donations. I did very well on growing the plugin, but I did have issues in a few particular areas. My biggest issue, and one of the things, especially when you're dealing with a large plugin, is support requests. It's so easy to underestimate what you're gonna get. We were getting hundreds of them a day at one point. In fact, by the second half of 2013, I had to outsource and hire somebody pretty much to just do support on this thing. I, could, I couldn't do that and a full-time job and other things at the same time. And as soon as you fall behind, people get angry. You start getting threats of legal action. You'll get all kinds of craziness if you don't keep up with support. That, now, when I say keep up with support, that doesn't mean you have to go out there and be able to answer every single person's query. That's not when somebody comes in and says, well, I have these 76 different plugins and when I turn yours on, this obscure one you've never heard of dies. It's your fault, fix it. You can't help that person. But being able to respond to them and offer maybe alternatives or even just be able to say, I'm sorry, I cannot troubleshoot that plugin. I can talk to the developer of that or however you want to handle that really does work good. In case of plugin incompatibilities, that's oftentimes what I would do is say, who is the developer? Where did you get, what plugin is it, this type of thing, and say, and I would reach out to that developer. I fixed an awful lot of plugin compatibilities just by reaching back out to the developer instead of the user. No help there to the user, at least probably not for a few weeks until we can get some sort of solution in place. But for a security plugin to work with as many plugins as it did, if I'm proud of anything I managed to pull off with that thing, it's probably that part, because it really did manage to help quite a bit doing it that way. And the same token with that is I underestimated the user base. When we launched uh, the first version of iThemes, we did a beta program for the first time. I never really was very good at unit tests and at that point, so most of our user testing was, was about 400 people we had on beta. And we, you know, somebody would have a complaint and we'd be like, oh, that's only one person. We pushed early. We brought down uh, Jeff Chandler from WP Tavern when I first met him in person. He, I was standing in a group of developers and he walked up to me and he goes, sir, you're that a-hole who crashed 10,000 sites. That was his introduction to me and we did. We pulled down a good number of sites. I completely underestimated how much testing or how where the testing can really screw things up and where we can get ourselves in trouble. We completely underestimated our user base. When I sold this, you know, right now it tells you uh, it's got over 700,000 active users we really underestimated the number of active users we had during the sale and up until that data was officially available. And that can really bite you, particularly in testing, particularly in QA as you come out with new major versions and rewrites of some of the more popular features. That was the hide backend feature where you can change WP admin to say something else. And it's very effective if that's what you're trying to do. However, we really didn't think many people were using it. We really didn't realize how bad it could crash a site and we paid for it quite handily that way. That was where we went from a few one stars to about 180 in just a couple of days, just on that one feature. Another thing we missed, and like I say, as we're underestimating our user bases, I'm talking about uh, we didn't know we had 700,000 or 600,000 active users at the time. Where was the data? Google Analytics went into it once it became iThemes. And it was an answer to some of these problems. Don't underestimate the amount of data you can collect. Don't wait until you're ready to try to make an exit with a product or you're trying to take it to the next level to start saying, oh, how do I make this work? Or who's using this? Or who's using that? From day one, 
look at what solutions are out there, watch your statistics, make sure you're keeping track of data. I say Google Analytics is a great free solution for this. Because when you're ready to do a major upgrade, if the areas you're targeting are not what your users want, you're not targeting really anything at all. That you might as well not upgrade at all. Nobody's gonna care. So keep that data, keep that data early. For monetary, for monetary reasons, I did not, you know, had, had the formula I used been applied to actual data, had I had that actual data, I would have done quite a bit better on the exit from this plugin, quite frankly. So even from monetary to crashes to angry users, just simply not knowing at the time where things were going really cost us quite a bit. We don't need no stinking beta. I did that plan a lot until I started with iThemes. That was the first time I actually did a beta program. By that point, we didn't, none of us, iThemes didn't really do betas either. They were, they were kind of the same as me. None of us really did that type of testing. And we learned an awful lot of lessons. Namely, we should have had a much bigger beta than 400 people. Don't be afraid to throw it out on GitHub and encourage people that are committing to it. or As you're asking for help, ask for help in the same way with throwing out a beta. Keep that development version available. If your code's on WordPress.org, it's GPL anyway. It's freely available. Develop it in something like GitHub, which is much more developer friendly, and it's much easier to ask somebody to help you out. Because WordPress.org, you can't do betas on it. GitHub, you can make your development branch, the active branch, and then when somebody goes to your GitHub and downloads it, they're probably not even gonna be able to, or not easily be able to download the actual version. They're downloading whatever you're working on. Now make sure what you're committing if you do that is not completely broken by choice. Or if you're one of those people that likes bar dumps and things like that and echo statements for debugging, try not to use four letter words, things like that. I see that a lot. But make sure that your beta, you know, just, uh, it's very easy to make a passive beta group just by asking those developers for help and just by putting your code in the right place. Unit tests are a waste of time. iThemes security still has approximately 0% coverage on its unit tests. Most of my other plugins are somewhere in the 80 to 100% plugins that I've done since I've left iThemes security. In fact, when I started with iThemes, I was so deep into the re redesign for what we had, we just never went back and wrote those tests. That was a mistake. So many, even the big crash we had, almost surely would have been found with a unit test, with proper unit testing. Unit testing, for anybody who's not a developer, this is where you actually run the code, and you run each individual function, you run each individual class, and you say, you know, you give it mock data, and you look for the correct response. Very easy to catch all kinds of problems. That doesn't do any of it, that, that particular plugin. Just about all these plugins spend as much time on your actual code as your unit test, and it's amazing how much less time you can spend on support. Other plugins I've launched now, and even some of my smaller ones, I have almost no support requests because I know the thing works. And I'm much more confident that the thing works. And if I do see a support request, I can almost, I can much more easily say, oh, I know exactly what you're doing and how you're getting there and correct for it that way. It's really saved me on support. It's really made my users a lot happier. And it really, saved, frankly, just saves my sanity. It is hard to ask for help. Again, like when I say, don't be afraid to ask for help, but it's not easy, it's, you know, it's, it would be hard for me to sit in this room and say, hey, can you uh, test this for me? It's very, it's much more easy to be passive, but using groups such as Advanced WordPress on Facebook, or the intermediate groups, or some of these other WordPress groups, or Facebook groups, or LinkedIn groups, or Slack, to ask for help, the WordPress core channel where you have folks like Nason and Norcross and Otto and all these people hanging out, just about all of them are willing to look at a code snippet for you if you ask them. Don't be afraid to approach people like that. On top of the fact that it's networking, it's, it's also it, it, asking somebody who's really into the WordPress core or really just into what you're doing as even as a competitor, some of these people like Pippin. Pippin will look at just about anybody's plugin and help you out, even if it's a direct competition to what he's doing. He's just that kind of a nice guy. But that's so much of the WordPress community I've found. Don't be afraid to ask. It's hard, but don't be afraid to do it. And of course, new features does not necessarily equal a better product. How many times do you see this? OS, OS XL Capitan, iOS 9. We hear this all over the news with these things. Why did they put a new Notes app in there, or whatever the new version is? Who cares? New features is not the better product. On the flip side, even when you compare it to something like Apple, the new iPhones look the same, but it's a completely different internals. They've changed everything else, but they have to sell the new features to market.
But that doesn't necessarily mean the new features are what makes it a better product. It's what's inside that counts. So doing a refactor of your code, cleaning up bugs in your code, all this other stuff is just as valuable as the new features themselves. In fact, a lot of times they can be more valuable because if you throw out a new feature that's buggy, you're just digging your hole a little bit deeper. So be very careful when you do release a new feature. Make sure it meets your core mission. If you're developing an SEO plugin and somebody asks you for the ability to lock people out or something like that, a security feature, say no. That's, that's a feature that's not part of the core mission of that plugin. On the flip side, if you are developing an SEO plugin and some new social network pops up and wants a new header and you haven't really kept up on what's going on with that network, be willing to add those types of features. Those are going to provide you value to your core mission. If the feature gets outside of that, however, be, be very quick to say no to it. Now, there's a lot of how I screwed up on that plugin. There's a number, number of things I did wrong with Sport. Usually, most of it's underestimating users. One thing I do I want to say, though, with this plugin is then why did I leave? If this plugin was so successful, why did I leave it? My core mission with this plugin was very different. It was a, it was a resume piece in some ways as I was going through grad school. And it was, designed, it, it was designed to scratch an itch. When I no longer had that itch to worry about, it was time to move on. I'll be honest, I do not use this plugin on my own sites, not because it's a bad plugin. It's simply that the use case for my sites, I don't have students logging into them. I use things like fail to ban at the server level and things like that. There are, there are new techniques I've learned to do it, and it was just time to move on. So don't be afraid to do that either. Walking away from some of these large projects, not a week goes by anymore in WP Tavern or post status if you're a member there, where you don't see somebody being acquired. Nick Haskins just this last week did quite well, it sounds like. I'm selling Aesop Story Engine. Brute Protect. They took, Automatic took all seven people. WooCommerce, I mean, how many people, there was all, close to 100 people, I think, all went to Automatic for that buyout. iThemes bought this plugin out. Having that end game in some ways actually isn't a bad idea at all. If you want to build something this big, make sure you have a motivation to reach that end game, whether it be donations or something else. But having that end game and just, instead of something that's just going to go on for perpetuate, or perpetually, really can, it'll help you focus, it'll help you meet that mission, and it'll some, in many cases, in my, especially in my case, I started forgetting why I wrote this plugin in the first place. I was just carrying it on that last year for the sake of carrying it on. That's not helping anybody at that point. Once you forget that part, it's time to get out. So don't be afraid to do so. You can make a pretty good buck, or you can do all kinds of neat things just by finding it's time to move on and taking it. That's my story with Better WP Security. Now I theme security. Does anybody have any questions with this? Uh, back it was first. The question is, how, would you, how do you integrate Google Analytics for the user base? I would actually go out and find better WP security. I think some of iThemes' other products do it. Download the code and take a look. The nice thing about GPL is you can use that code just fine, um, and it's working. I was looking at custom tags when I did do a Google search, but now that it's done for WordPress, don't just modify it to work for your own use and take a look at what the code that's existing for it is what I would mostly recommend. Somebody else, there was a... Yeah. Uh, what do you of, uh, I've done Help Desk, I've done, or Zendesk, I've done Help Scout, I've done email, I've done forums. It all kind of depends. They all had their strengths and weaknesses. My biggest problem, actually, frankly, was I switched them too much. I'd get really annoyed with, this doesn't do that. And then I'd completely switch systems and tick off all my users. The biggest lesson I learned in that is whatever you use, they're all designed for that purpose, and they all do a fairly decent job. Learn it well and stick with it. If you want to be a ticket-based support, Help Desk and Zendesk, or Help Scout and Zendesk do a great job. Forum support. Now, if you do forum support, one of the biggest things is getting a community in there, like the .org forums, that'll help answer questions for you, because that's some of your greatest market. And that goes back to asking for help and be willing to accept it, but learn it. Be willing, you know, if that's what you're going to use, know every little nuance of that system and stick with it. If you switch, you're just going to create pain for yourself and for others. And weaknesses can usually be overcome with just a small adjustment to workflow. Right now, if, if I had to pick one right now, I'm digging Help Scout now that I've really started to understand it. We use it at 10up for some of our own projects. And it's, it's pretty solid, it's just easy to get in and out of, and it's easier to search back on old things. That wasn't always the case with Help Scout. When I first got it, I absolutely loathed it. 
But now that I've gotten time to use it, actually learn it, I, I can dig it. I'm, it works pretty well. Anyone else? I think that's fine. The question is, how, how do you handle people's request to customize your, your product? And it's going to depend. On some products, for instance, I work very heavily now on the Elastic Press project, which is a 10-up project that's designed to work in Elasticsearch. It's a very high-end, free search engine that can replace WordPress search. It's a very good job. It's a very solid API. So extending it, isn't. there's no modifications almost needed. You almost never have to touch core. If I find a bug in core, I put a pull request back in and try to help. Those types of plugins, I have no qualms about. A plugin that's very closed, and such as well, Jetpack used to, like if, I, if somebody asked me to modify Jetpack comments, I would frankly say no. That's where that no thing's going to come out very good, because they're, 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 they're nightmarish. Every time, then what happens if a security, a sec, uh, heavy security vulnerability comes out, and you have to make a critical update? If you have 40 hours invested in the redevelopment, it's almost impossible to get the get the money back to do that update. So watch for those heavy, those, those good APIs. WooCommerce is a great example of an excellent API. Some of Caldera's products have excellent APIs. Gravity Forms has excellent APIs. But try to keep your extensions separate rather than modifying core. And the same, you know, it's the same thing they tell you with WordPress core, honestly. Anyone else? Sir? I approached a few companies. I, uh, Chris Lemma was an excellent help in this one, actually. He uh, was kind enough to donate some of his time to me to help price it right based on what we understood to be the user base at the time. And I, the biggest thing, though, was just looking for companies that were doing it. Uh, and the case of iThemes was not the first company I, chose, I, I would have thought of. They actually approached me. So there was, that was a little bit back and forth, but I had talked to uh, a number of the security guys, you know, we all know the names. I had talked to the agency I worked at the time was trying to get a product division, so I, I worked with them a little bit, and it was just a matter of weighing what was going. It was big enough at that time that there was interest. Any plugin, I think right now over a million downloads, you can go out to Jeff Chandler and ask him to write a, or even anything with any kind of decent user base at all, ask Jeff Chandler or Brian Cogsgar, that's WP Tavern or uh, Post Status, to put a post up there. and. It's real easy to get this stuff advertised. Aesop was a great one like that. He put a tweet out, and it wound up in all the WordPress news within a couple of weeks. And I don't think he was on the market with that thing more than a month. It sold fairly quickly. And you see that with some of the others as well. Just about all the sales right now I'm finding uh, on WP Tavern, all these plug-in sales and things like that. And they're very good at helping guys get that out. And back. So the question is, okay, the, is there a formula then, the question is then, is there a formula to create users with amount of support? Is that, re, is that rephrase? I want to make sure I get it on the camera too. Yeah, just like, you know, if, if, I were, if I were to do a plugin and I wanted to know roughly how much time I would have spent doing support on this plugin, you know, what would that be? If my plugin was just doing a widget, it would probably be very minimal. If my plugin's Jetpack that connects to other services and everything else, it could get quite high. Security is a very high level. I would say I did it more hours of development versus hours of support. When I first did this, I, I would put in probably 20 or 30 hours a week in co writing the code and maybe 15 minutes a week in support. By the time it hit a million downloads, that was probably evened out to about 15 and 15 in hours. By the time I sold it, it was I had another person doing 30 to 40 hours a week on support, and I was just trying to keep up on the other side of things. And there's still a full-time support person with iThemes that does nothing but the support for that plugin. But security is a very high, you know, somebody locks themselves out, is that, that, that whole fine line between security and usability. Yoast, I know, has a fairly high uh, 
support link just because of the size of what they're doing and all the little things, you know, Google doesn't have my site, so they're going to get a support question like that. If it's something more visual, it might be a little bit lighter on support, but it's really going to depend on the type of features and how those features are implemented. If you have a great UX and people can understand what's going on, I could have probably cut my own support by 80%. <laughs> So it, it, I'd love to say there's a, there's a hard and fast formula, but you just kind of have to watch, you know, what's the chance of somebody screwing this feature up as they're doing it? The higher that chance, the higher support load's going to be. Sure. Sir? I've never really worried about it. The question is, did I ever think anybody was going to beat me to the market? No, I, I really like Pippin's approach to this. I, we're all in this kind of together. Let's help each other out. And I've given advice to other people building similar plugins. I've worked features back in from other plugins, and, and I've had a very good dialogue going with some some folks that when that it wasn't the idea wasn't competition. Now, of course, when it when it's sold, that changes a little bit because now it is a for-profit business. Pippin actually has managed to keep this very open, even with that for-profit. I think this is a little bit different once we sold it just for various reasons. But keeping that dialogue open and not worrying about it, if they beat you tomorrow, then next week when you do your next release, now you know what they've done and you just come out with it one step better. And that ability, you know, kind of like Android and iPhone right now. Nobody's really, you know, whoever's got the newer phone seems to be what's better that week. Keeping that innovation going and pushing each other forward is going to help both sides. I think I got time for one more. Anybody? Easy. Well, thank you guys very much.